Hi there, and welcome to Let's Talk Farm to Fork, the post-harvest podcast that interviews people of interest across the food supply chain within the fresh produce sector. Today on our show, I'm joined by Dr. Stephen Lappage from Fight Food Waste, who I'll be talking to about how their cooperative research center aims to reduce supply chain losses through their research and development programs. So with no further delays, let's get started. Hi, Stephen. How are you? Thanks for joining me on the podcast today. Thanks, Mitch. I look forward to the discussion. Before we get into it, I just want to give you the opportunity to tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do. And while you're at it, please tell us a little something about yourself that most people don't know. Yeah, sure. So I've got an interesting background, I guess, in both animal and environmental science. So for the first kind of 10 years, 10, 15 years of my career, I followed the animal side and I've got a PhD in returning captive bred animals to the wild and studying whether reintroduction was an ethical conservation technique. I then chased pest animals for 10 years, foxes and wild dogs and feral pigs and so on. But all of that really led to a passion for industry-based science. I kind of never wanted to pursue the uh, the theoretical science and I didn't go on with the, the postdocs after my PhD. I, I wanted to get in and start working with industry. So given where I am now in terms of working with food waste, it may seem a really weird match. <laughs> but yeah. it, in one way, whether it's managing feral pigs or trying to prevent food waste, it's all about a sustainable future and in particular a sustainable food future. I guess one thing that might be interesting that most people don't know is that I was always meant to take over uh, the family electrical business which had been going for some like 55 years when I did work experience as an electrician and it was on a 50 degree day in Adelaide and I think I nearly passed out in a roof space and uh, (laughs) returned to the home that night and said dad sell the business, I'm never taking it on. And he did a couple of years later, and I pursued a very different career. Yeah, wow. I kind of went down a similar route myself, and it definitely wasn't for me either. So uh, similar stories. But on that note, let's talk farm to fork. So continuing on from you telling us what you do, it would seem you have quite a lengthy background in working in both agricultural and environmental cooperative research centers. Would you mind telling us how you managed to find yourself in such a position within the industry and what the goal is behind your work? Yeah, sure. So I mentioned the reintroduction work before. My first job out of um, university was uh, working for the Queensland government as a fox and feral pig zoologist. And I happened to meet the uh, CEO of what was then the Pest Animal Control CRC. And we got friendly and we are talking and they advertised a position, uh, which I ended up winning. And that was to try and do a program to educate people about the potential for foxes if they should establish in Tasmania. At the time, there was some foxes that had been taken over to Tasmania. So that really got me into the CRC area. Then I was with that CRC and iterations thereof for another 10 years. So it takes to about 2012, I was to move back to Canberra after having lived in Adelaide for the the seven years before that. And I thought, well, maybe it's time for a change. Family didn't want to move to Canberra. And uh, so I started working for the primary industries in South Australia. And uh, part of that role was business development. And they were really pushing on the sustainability of the food industry uh, in South Australia at the time. And uh, so the idea was born to focus on a key area of sustainability for the food industry and that quickly emerged as food waste because you don't have to dig too deep to realize that while we're a fantastic food producer in this country we're also unfortunately one of the worst food wasters in the world we're in the top four and the writing was on the wall back in you know 2015 or so when we were starting this process to say this is going to come back to haunt us one day and that's something we need to start addressing now and uh... hmm. yeah yeah wow so what do you think is the biggest challenge within the food supply chain right now and how do you think we can overcome it background but i still think the sustainability of the industry is one of the biggest challenges and of course food loss and waste and i'd just like to give a a couple of stats around that firstly worth mentioning that historically food waste has been seen as a cost of doing business and very few producers actually have really good data on their historical losses of food waste throughout time and uh, even current years if we ask a, a food producer what their losses are then they can't always tell us yeah 
you listeners are probably aware Australia is a great food producer that we produce enough food to um, feed 75 million people which is three times our population but we still have five million people in this country which are food insecure and that means they don't know at some point in the year where their next meal is coming from and they don't have the money to go out and, and that's a shocking situation to be honest that we are such a good food producer yet we've still got so many people going hungry in what is supposed to be the lucky country. And of course, it's not just here. Globally, there's uh, about 10% of the world population which is undernourished or food insecure, and that's about 800 million. Right now, the World Resources Institute is predicting there's about 56% food gap between now and 2050 based on current production system. So unless we start changing the way we produce and consume food, we are going to have uh, a lot of food shortages in the future. And that's something that we all need to be mindful of. And we also need to start changing the, the global mindset when it comes to food. We, we do see food waste as someone else's problem in many ways. And really, food needs to be as precious as oil or diamonds, which I'm sure you're aware you can't eat to, to stay alive. The overall movement has got to be about making food waste a, a social taboo, you know, that it's just socially unacceptable no matter where you are in the world. Yeah, Definitely. So what would you say is the most unexpected discovery you found when it comes to fruits and vegetables traveling through the food supply chain? Yeah, the figures on fruit and vegetables are just shocking, to, to be honest. So FAO, Food and Agriculture Organization, estimates that globally about 45% of fruit and veg that are grown for human consumption are never eaten. You're losing nearly half your crop. And yeah, that, that's a lot it's of crazy, right? right there. It's just a crazy figure. And in some countries, that figure goes much higher. And even in Australia, some areas, if we look from farm to fork, we're talking 60% fruit and vegetable losses. Of course, it costs exactly the same to grow a graded out potato, for example, in terms of the water and the energy. And, and so all those resources are lost when we don't eat the food. So that's uh, one of the biggest you know, discoveries for me when I started getting into this field. Mm. We, we did some back of the envelope kind of calculations back in 2015 and the estimates are about $1.7 billion worth of fruit and veg is lost just in primary production and from pack houses in this country. And then if you take that through to what's also lost in retail and uh, in the household, you're probably doubling that. Um, so it's a fair proportion of our $20 billion a year food waste bill is just in fruit and veg. In, t in terms of the, the reasons why, I'm sure you'd be aware of a couple of them, but cosmetic standards of uh, the retailers often get blame. But look, I think it's worth mentioning that ultimately that's the consumer that sets the cosmetic standards. It's mm -hmm. the, the fruit and veg that they walk past in, in the supermarket or at, at a uh, weekend market that helps determine what is the acceptable cosmetic standard? And that's just to try and avoid food waste at the, the retail stage as well. So we're all part of that process and we all need to be more accepting of blemishes if we're going to change the standards. The other area is in the cold chain and the current estimates are about 25% of annual production of fruit and veg, which is worth about three billion throughout the supply chain uh, are lost through poor cold chain management. The way people would often see that is the, the lovely strawberries they bring home in that punnet and two days later they're grown fur and you think, you know, how can that happen? Well, that's often happened because there's been poor cold chain management in getting those strawberries to the supermarket or even on the way home from the supermarket. So yeah, a couple of big areas that we need to be concentrating on. Yeah, poor cold chain management, it's definitely a big one. So on that note, from where you stand, what would you identify as being one of the biggest pain points or blind spots within the supply chain uh, when it comes to food loss? Yeah, so the, the, the two I just mentioned, it's certainly uh, key, but the one that I'd really like to talk about at the moment is the whole area of food rescue. Now, we touched on this before in terms of 5 million people being food insecure. Mm. What the food rescue agencies really need is more fresh produce. It is the short shelf life, harder commodities to manage, but it's also what keeps us healthy. And right now, for most food producers, it doesn't matter whether it's fruit and veg or uh, meats or uh, dairy, it's cheaper to throw it away than it is to donate food. Uh, and again, that's just a perverse situation in this country and many countries around the world. But it's something that uh, a lot of other countries have started to address Recently, we did a project with Food Bank Australia and KPMG looking at what tax incentives could be created 
to support primary producers to donate food and also including things like not just the donation itself or the food itself, but the transportation to get it to food rescue charities and the logistics and the cold storage. They're all critical steps in the supply chain to feeding those 5 million people that we need to. And the figures are quite amazing. So it would probably cost around 50 to 100 million a year to implement such a system. And probably the best comparison is the R&D or research and development tax incentive. So we have 50 industry participants within our CRC and most of them would be claiming an R&D tax incentive to do something to reduce food waste. But the simple act of donation, they can't claim. And, and again, that's you know, a, a very strange situation. For an implementation cost of around 50 to 100 million, the uh, KPMG estimate that there would be a societal benefit around 2 billion yeah, wow. a year. And that's an amazing return on investment and just something I think we really need to take a, a good look at. Yeah, that's great. So has the COVID pandemic and the quarantine that's come with that, has that for better or worse had any effect on your day-to-day operations? And if so, how? Yeah, so we've had a couple of projects that have been delayed six plus months, and that's mainly due to travel restrictions. Also getting access to things like supermarkets and looking at different initiatives and things like that has been difficult during that time because certainly the retailers have been absolutely flat out. And I think most people would be aware of that. Certainly COVID caused some interesting changes in food waste behaviour throughout the time over the last 18 months or so, because we saw an initial increase in food waste because everyone was stockpiling food. And when that food started to come by to its use by and best before dates, people were throwing it out in kind of record numbers, which is an awful situation because, of course, they'd taken it in ahead of someone else and someone else could have used that food. But then we saw the reverse happen. And that's when people didn't want to be going to the shops. They started taking a real interest in how do I reduce my food waste and how do I make my food last as long as possible? Mm. And we saw massive uptake in things like education campaigns and tips and tricks to extending your food shelf life and and doing more with leftovers and using odd ingredients. We had a campaign called um, Fight Food Waste, It's Easy As. It had record numbers of people hitting on it, but also following it through to the end point of how do we actually start changing behavior? I think the reach was about 5 million people and the investment was about $100,000, which was actually stimulus money. So, you know, we can reach a lot of people with not a huge amount of money and start getting change if the conditions are right. Right now, we're seeing that kind of COVID food waste behavior returning to normal as uh, people get busier again, but all you need is another lockdown and the cycle starts again so yeah it's really led to some interesting behavior but what it has shown is that deep down most people want to reduce their food waste it's a matter of time and things like that that they just don't always have that often leads to people wasting food yeah definitely yeah i agree i think people deep down really do want to reduce food waste So when it comes to food loss and sustainability within the cold chain, you were mentioning earlier, you were talking about some of these areas, but I was just wondering, which areas are you most curious about at the moment? What are you doing the most research on when it comes to food loss and sustainability within the cold chain? Yeah, an interesting question. The one that we're really starting to push on now is this whole area of upcycled foods. And I'm sure many people will be saying, what the hell is an upcycled food, excuse the language, but a classic example is Vegemite. You know, it's a food that's made from ingredients that would have otherwise been wasted or thrown away. So Vegemite is made from brewer's yeast, which is a byproduct of the brewing process. We've been eating it for decades and most people wouldn't think of it as coming from a waste stream, but that's exactly what happened. Now, of course, we're getting much more innovative in the area of upcycled foods and we're brewing beer from day-old bread, for example. There's a, a beer called Toast Ale overseas. There was one in Australia called Lofa that was brewed from day-old bread. Well, that's a great use of a day-old bread because bread is one of the most wasted food items in this country. And if we can put it to other uses and rather than sending it to landfill, then that's a great way forward. Absolutely. So we've just taken on one of the global leaders in this area, a new program leader called Francesca Goodman-Smith. She's joined us from a supermarket chain in in New Zealand where she was really focused on upcycled foods. 
And so she'll be doing a whole strategy around upcycled foods in Australia, their potential, the, the low-hanging fruit as such. And I'm, I'm really excited about that. But I'd just like to, to also give a little plug for another company that uh, we've had a bit to do with, and that's Natural Evolution Foods up in far north Queensland. And they've been turning grated out bananas, green bananas and so on, into things like powders and prebiotics, cake mixtures and ointments and a whole range of different exciting, innovative products. The possibilities are really endless. And I think it's something coming from an innovation side in a previous CRC where I was developing new products to control or manage um, pest animals. I, I really like to see that that innovation happening in this space now. So yeah, that's what gets me out of bed in the morning. Yeah, awesome. On the back end of you talking about natural evolution, are there any other groups or innovative products out there within the industry that you're excitedly keeping a watchful eye on? Yeah, in answer to that, I think it's really the whole global movement around the upcycled foods. I've I've kind of outlined what's happening here in Australia, but there's some really innovative stuff happening overseas. There's food transformation hubs where people can take surplus food, that the crop residues kind of thing that they can't sell and, and turn them into something of value. And just the whole innovation ecosystem around this i think is something really exciting europe's probably leading at the moment but we're certainly trying to to catch up pretty quick i'd love to to see a day where i can walk into a supermarket and see a full aisle dedicated to these sustainable innovative upcycled foods but that won't happen unless of course there's good consumer acceptance and while there's i think there's some early adopters that are really looking for these products in the market it's not until we get them more widely accepted that you'll get significant investment in this area. But that that's what I'm keeping my eye on. Oh, that's great. So what's one thing you wish you had known before you began working at Fight Food Waste? Yeah, I came into this field as a technical scientist and an innovator, as I mentioned before. But of course, managing food waste isn't a technical problem. It's part of the solution, but it's not the solution. And it's really a social challenge. And really, unless we start changing our mindset around food waste, then the technical solutions just aren't going to deliver what we need in terms of trying to halve food waste in this country by 2030. Um, But that said, I can see the tide changing at the moment. Certainly the media is interested, the public are interested. Our surveys show about 75% of people that we've surveyed around Australia want to reduce their food waste. They want to see this as something that governments, individuals, restaurants, retailers are all pushing for and that that's a great thing the momentum's there we've just got to be able to provide the right information and to make sure that we change food waste from what is generally an unconscious behavior whether it's in business or in our households and make it conscious so we think about it before we do it and when we start thinking about it we start changing our own behavior Yeah, I think if we can address some of those unconscious behaviors when it comes to food waste, I think we'll see some dramatic change in the future. So as we come to a close, I just want to ask you, what's the number one takeaway you really want the listeners to absorb from this episode? Yeah, it really is that everyone has a role to play here. And when we ask people, as I mentioned before, do you want to do something about food waste? Yes, most people say they do. But then you say, how much food do you waste? And they say, oh, well, we don't waste anything. It's everyone else that wastes <laughs> food. <Yeah. laughs> and there, there's also uh, a couple of, I guess, quirks in what is food waste, because many people feel that if you feed it to your chooks or your dog, or if you put it into your compost, then it's not wasted food. Well, unfortunately, it is. As soon as those nutrients are lost to the the human food supply chain, it's still considered food waste. It's still a much better solution than it going to landfill, but it's still food waste. So making sure that we all do our bit to prevent food waste from occurring in the first place. And that means buying the right amount of food, cooking just what you need, storing it properly, eating your leftovers. It's all those things that we need to do to change this situation. And that's something that every listener can take away. We've got to make food waste as socially unacceptable as littering, for example. We've been able to do that in this country and you don't see litter on the side of the road like you used to when I was growing up. And we've been able to do it with some of the health issues like skin cancer. The Slip Slop Slap campaign has been brilliant in halving rates of skin cancer in this country. Now it's time to do it with food waste. Yeah, absolutely. Well, that's all for today's episode of Let's Talk Farm to Fork. Thanks for listening and thank you, Stephen, for joining me today. Thanks, Mitch.
For any listeners who would like to know more about Fight Food Waste, check out the link in the description of this episode. Make sure to subscribe to this podcast so that you never miss an episode, and don't forget to leave a review and share with your friends. Until next time, you've been listening to Let's Talk Farm to Fork, a post-harvest podcast. Thank you.